Well, good morning and welcome to the benefice of Warrington St Philip's, where we are today, and St John the Baptist at Wetley Rocks. Now, I'm just trying a bit experimental today. Instead of just standing there, I'm going to wander around, which means I've got to hold my phone in front of me and my arm's going to get tired at some point. But it does give you a chance to maybe get dizzy or just see these beautiful things we've got in the church, like these stained glass windows behind me. Well, today it's called Passion Sunday, or the fifth Sunday of Lent. So, as usual, we're going to start with some liturgy. Jesus died for all, so that living, people should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised to life for us. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and in faith. And so we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as I said last week, we are going to be back in church for Easter. We're actually also going to have a meditation service to think about the cross and all that Jesus has done for us, which will be here in St Philip's on Good Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon. So maybe see some of you there. We'll also live stream it so you can see it from home too. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and it's simply calm. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within To the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it But it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of Worship, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, 
Cause it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it But it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus The Bible reading for the fifth Sunday of Lent comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, starting at verse 20. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks amongst those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard and said, It had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. But Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today the church celebrates Passion Sunday, the fifth Sunday of Lent, and our thoughts begin to turn to the last events of Jesus' life on earth. Next week we shall celebrate Palm Sunday, Jesus entering Jerusalem and being hailed as a king by the people. And we see in the events recorded as we journey through Holy Week that it was not an easy journey for Jesus to make. The doubt, the inner conflict, and yet today's reading suggests a recognition from Jesus that the end is approaching and we are drawn in journeying with him to wrestling with what the life and death of Jesus means for us as his disciples. And the reading from John 12, 20 to 33 appears a strange one on first hearing. It might appear to make no sense at all. From the outset we are drawn into a theme of liberation with the setting of the celebration of the Passover festival, the celebration of the liberation from slavery in Egypt. And indeed John places the passage before us today after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and a narrative of Jesus' increasing popularity with the crowd because of the signs that he had performed. And amongst the many who have come to worship at the festival, John draws attention to some Greeks who wish to see Jesus. And when Jesus is told of this, instead of being delighted that people are interested in him and arranging a meeting, he responds to Philip and Andrew's request by starting to speak in riddles. So what are we to make of all this? There is no doubt that at this time Jesus' popularity was on the rise and that there is fear and concern amongst the religious authorities of the day. 
At a time of religious fervour and political tensions, uh, the two often go hand in hand, people were undoubtedly drawn to Jesus and it was not uncommon for individuals to be claiming that they had come with special purpose of restoring Israel and overthrowing the Roman, Roman rulers. Tensions then were high. And there was much at stake in terms of religious observance and political unrest. In this context, John draws attention to God-fearing Greeks, for why else might they have been at the festival, as outsiders who want to know more about this man Jesus and the claims he was making. In his response to Philip and Andrew's request, Jesus avoids the temptation of becoming the local ce celebrity, no doubt with the memory of his entry into Jerusalem firmly in his mind. What we don't read in John's account of this account encounter is perhaps the questioning why the Greeks wanted to see him, of trying to decide whether it was nothing more than idle curiosity or whether they were genuine in their desire for an audience with him. Perhaps they genuinely wanted to debate on an intellectual level and question him in order to come to their own mind about him, or alternatively, whether they simply want to see him so that they could say that they had. And so Jesus in his answer goes deeper than the immediately obvious. Unconcerned with the motives of those who want to see him, he begins to explain what he's really about, and that has nothing to do with seeing him, with intellectual debate, or following him because he is the celebrity of the day. The time has come. My time has come, says Jesus, in stark contrast to the earlier comments in John that his time has not yet come. If you remember in John 2, to his, he speaks to his mother at the wedding in Cana and John 7 when some tried to seize him while he was teaching in the temple courts. Here then is the moment to which John has been pointing. When the time is come for the Son of Man to be lifted up in order that all the world might see Jesus and recognise him, in order that God's glory might be revealed. This will be the time when all the world, represented by the Greeks and not just faithful Israel, will see and believe in him, not through intellectual debate, but through the saving action of Jesus, the man who willingly goes to the cross to confront sin and evil. And Jesus uses the agricultural imagery of seeds in the ground to drive home his point suggesting that it is not going to be as might be expected. In fact, on the contrary, it might look hidden and be perceived as a complete disaster. The joy for those of us on this side of the resurrection is that we know the ending to the story. But Jesus here is painting a very different picture than what people might have been looking for or expecting. The time for preparation is over and the true picture of who Jesus is, is about to be revealed. One of the major themes of John's Gospel is seeing and knowing. And we see it, if you'll excuse the pun, it being played out in this passage. The Greeks wish to see Jesus, not only in the physical sense, but in getting to know him and who he truly was. We might ask ourselves, what is it that we want to see in Jesus? What is our motivation? Are we merely curious in seeing what it's all about without necessarily wanting to take to heart the disturbing points that Jesus goes on to make about losing our life? Interestingly, we are not told whether the Greeks get to see Jesus both in the literal sense of meeting him or in them getting to know who he claimed to be. There are several responses to merely seeing Jesus, to being inquisitive, to recognising the man that people have been talking about 
and coming to believe who he said he was. And Jesus is perhaps indicating in his response that it is simply not enough to see and engage in an intellectual discussion, but what is required is truly knowing him, is a change in attitude as to our whole life. And this from a rabbi who, as we know from the Gospels, was not afraid to engage in, religious de in rigorous debate, as was their tradition. So what are we to make of Jesus' discussion of our losing our life in order that we might keep it for eternal life? So often, I think that we interpret this in the sense of some kind of form of grand-scale martyrdom, that our discipleship might demand some grand gesture of costly sacrifice. Yet it seems to me that what Jesus is asking of us is the small, almost seemingly inconsequential acts contained within the process of dying to self, of being attentive to the ways in which we are tempted to act in ways that serve self rather than God, of the daily decision to face the cross and attempt by God's grace and God's grace alone to live lives that reflect God's glory. It is in these daily acts of self-denial that God's glory continues to be revealed. And in many ways, these acts are buried like the grain that falls into the earth. They are often held between God and ourselves, buried in the soil of our ordinary, everyday, daily existence. There is a sense in which it requires a certain degree of dogged determination and persistence. And I suspect that John is warning us in the words of Jesus that it is not for the faint-hearted. And just as we might wait for new, school, new shoots to break forth from the ground, so too we wait with patience for what, will, what God will bring about in God's good time. It is a timely lesson, perhaps, as we begin to emerge tentatively from lockdown, with Easter just around the corner. We are a faith community that has death and resurrection at the heart of its being. As we journey over the next few weeks with Jesus, as he makes his way to Golgotha, what might God be asking us as individuals and as communities to allow to fall to the ground and die in order that it might bear much fruit in the future. And so may God grant us dogged determination, faithful patience, that we might see God's glory. Amen. We're going to use the Book of Common Prayer intercessions today. Now this starts with an exhortation to pray for the church militant, which can give you the wrong idea. Militant means involved in the struggle. That is the church here below still struggling compared to the church triumphant already in heaven. Almighty and ever living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee, most mercifully to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord. And grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes and governors, especially thy servant Elizabeth, our Queen, 
that under her we may be godly and quietly governed, and grant unto her whole counsel, and to all that are put in authority under her, that they may truly and impartially minister justice, to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests and deacons, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that, with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. And we join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
collect a special prayer for this week. Holy God, in the Saviour's cross, your boundless love meets human sin. Strengthen and deliver us, that we may know the victory is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a blessing. Christ crucified draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.